In this lecture, I want to look at Revelation chapters 2 and 3, which are commonly called the seven letters to the seven churches. And chapters 2 and 3 are a very important section of the book because they consist entirely of Christ's words to the churches, which alone makes them very important. Uh, this section uh, provides exhortations and warnings and promises that play out throughout uh, the rest of the book. Um, and this is important because, remember, the book of Revelation, among other things, is an epistle. And, and an epistle was meant to be understood by the first century readers. Um, and the chapters 2 and 3 reveal that all of the things that Jesus warned about in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 were already taking place in the churches when John wrote uh, the book of Revelation. That includes, as indicated in Revelation 2 and 3, persecution by Jews, persecution in general, false prophets, uh, falling away from the faith, uh, love growing cold. And so all of these things are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, and Jesus had warned about this uh, before he died. Now, but remember also, the seven churches that are listed in Revelation 2 and 3, and I'll just name them here, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, all of these seven churches, as we have said, uh, are representative of all of the churches. The entire universal church in any time in history and in any place in history. But uh, recall also that in the book of Revelation, um, uh, the book ends with the second coming of Christ, uh, although that is mentioned at various places at the end of each of the major sections, but the concentration at the end of the book is on the new heaven and the new earth. And as we discussed when we were talking about the church in Revelation, we see the picture of uh, the New Jerusalem and, and the Bride of Christ. So one of the things uh, that the book does is give us what the church is going to be like uh, in the new creation. And so part of the strategy, I think, of Revelation 2 and 3 uh, is that the churches, and this, since the churches, the seven churches, are representative of all the churches, including our churches today, this should cause us to evaluate ourselves and to evaluate our own churches uh, to see how we compare with the way the church is designed to be. Because you may recall, uh, the the bride of Christ uh, is said in uh, Revelation 19 to be clothed with pure linen, pure garments. Whereas uh, in uh, the church at Laodicea, chapter 3, verse 17, it says it has soiled clothes. Um, also in uh, chapter uh, 2 and 3, uh, it looks like the, the church, particularly with respect to Ephesus, Pergamum, and Sardis, are unprepared. They're generally unprepared for the Lord's coming. Uh, whereas the bride's ardent prayer in Revelation 22, verse 17, is for the bridegroom to come. And so you look at the faithfulness of the bride of Christ and, in general, the lukewarmness or lack of faithfulness or falling back of the different churches uh, that are revealed in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, in Revelation 3, verse 10, um, Jesus says, to the church in Philadelphia, he says, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now that phrase, those who dwell on the earth, or the earth dwellers, occurs again and again throughout the book of Revelation. Um, and it always has a negative connotation. It refers to the Worldly people, people, everyone, all of us, Christians and non-Christians alike, dwell on the earth. But the phrase, those who dwell on the earth, refers not only to those who are on or in the earth, 
but those who are of the earth. In other words, they have a worldly mindset, a worldly frame of reference. And this highlights the fact that according to the book of Revelation, everyone in humanity is in one of two mutually opposed camps. Either we uh, are all seen as members of uh, the church or those who dwell on the earth. We are citizens of heaven or those uh, who are citizens of the earth. Uh, we are those who worship the lamb or worship the beast. Uh, we are those who are sealed by God or those who bear the mark of the beast. Those whose names have been written in the book of life or those whose names have not been written in the book of life. Those who are part of the beloved city or those who are part of the great city. There is no neutral or third alternative, and we need to recognize this, that the same thing is true today. Every human being is, one, is a member of one or of two mutually opposed camps. Now, God has his people out of every tribe, tongue, and nation, and God uses us to try and draw those people who are now of the earth those who dwell on the earth, to become citizens of heaven along with us. Um, and therefore, we need to approach people, we need to approach the church with a heavenly mindset. And that is what leads, that leads to why these two chapters are so important. Because in these chapters, Jesus evaluates the church and then he makes promises to the overcomers to those who are faithful. So I want to briefly take a look at how he evaluates the church. He evaluates, uh, for each of the churches, he gives negative evaluations and positive evaluations. Now I'm going to concentrate here on the things he says to more than one church, because when he repeats something, and this is true of all biblical writers and of Jesus himself, repetition indicates emphasis on something that is important. And so uh, Jesus essentially makes three negative evaluations of the churches. And um, the uh, first thing, uh, or actually four negative evaluations of the churches. He first condemns idolatry and immorality. To Pergamum, uh, he says, uh, he talks about those who lead others to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. And to Thyatira, he talks about the prophetess Jezebel who led some to commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, in the first century, eating food sacrificed to idols was a huge issue. Um, but the reason why, and that may not be the specific issue that we have to deal with today, but the issue, it links immorality and, and uh, things sacrificed to idols because the idolatry um, uh, of eating things sacrificed to idols indicates an idolatry that had already taken place in the heart. What do I mean? Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. What's the very first commandment? It's a commandment against idolatry. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of Egypt. You, have, you shall have no other gods besides me. Uh, but idolatry, as I see it, and as Martin Luther saw it, is the fundamental sin of mankind. That's why it's the number one command of the Ten Commands. And as Luther points out, you know, the other commands talk about you shall not uh, cheat, you, sh you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not uh, murder, you shall not commit adultery. But what he also pointed out is, when we commit any of those other sins, we are also committing idolatry. Why? Because if you commit adultery with someone, you're, you're, you're both an adulterer, but you're also an idolater. Why? Because when you commit adultery, you are putting your physical pleasure over your love of Jesus, over your faithfulness to Jesus. When a person steals, you're putting that thing over your faithfulness to Jesus. So you're showing yourself to be an idolater as well as a thief or an adulterer or what have you. So to break any of these... And so idolatry leads to all the other sins. 
That's why I believe that when he's talking to uh, Pergamum and Thyatira, he links idolatry and immorality. Now, the second thing Jesus condemns uh, also goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, to both Smyrna and Philadelphia, he condemns those who say they are Jews, but are not. But they are a synagogue of Satan. What's going on here? Now, throughout, as I've mentioned in other lectures, throughout the book of uh, not only Revelation, but in the New Testament, all of the names and things that related to Old Testament Israel, the temple, and so on and so forth, are reapplied in the New Testament to the church. Therefore, the church is called the temple of God. The church is called the seed of Abraham, called the royal priesthood, called the true circumcision, and so on and so forth. In other words, the church is the new, true, spiritual Israel. Now, in the first century when John wrote, many, many believers were, of course, ethnic Jews. The first believers were ethnic Jews. But when he says that uh, he condemns those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. What he's talking about is they may have been ethnic Jews, but they are not true spiritual Jews. True spiritual J Jews are those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so these uh, Jewish people in the churches had actually never truly broken with their past. Uh, they had never really... Uh, adopted Jesus as their new allegiance in their life. And this is an important thing for us because many churches are based, uh, I mean, here in the United States, are very largely racially based. In Africa, they're very largely tribally based. Many churches are socioeconomically based, which is showing that we may say that Jesus is our Lord, but we are really putting our race our tribe, our socioeconomic status, or other things like that first. So Jesus is calling us to evaluate our own churches. Uh, then he also repeatedly condemns um, well, the failure of churches to evaluate themselves. So you see, uh, he says, for example, to Sardis, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And to Laodicea, he says, you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Um, we can all have a false conception of ourselves. Um, and so he is specifically condemning uh, idolatry and immorality. Uh, he is condemning uh, those who have never left their worldly allegiance, even though they say they have, and he is condemning uh, those who do not evaluate themselves. We need to get in line with Jesus. What is most important to Jesus has got to be most important to us. And if that evaluation indicates that we need to make changes in our churches, then for heaven's sake, make them. But then Jesus commends uh, the churches for various things. And again, I want to concentrate on the things that Jesus commends more than once. Uh, what does he commend? The first thing he commends is perseverance. He tells the church at Ephesus, uh, he says, you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. He also commends Thyatira's perseverance and Philadelphia's perseverance. What's perseverance? It's staying faithful. It's not falling back into sin or apostasy. It's continuing to do what we ought to do day in and day out, in good times and bad, whether we want to or not, and whether anybody else recognizes it or not, because these seven letters to the seven churches are telling us Jesus recognizes it. Now, the second thing Jesus repeatedly commends, which is closely related to perseverance, is not denying the faith, not denying his name tells Pergamum, you hold fast my name and did not deny the faith even in the days of Antipas. And he tells Philadelphia, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, the context of both of those 
had to do with pressure put on people, or even persecution, because they were Christians. And that same thing can happen today. Obviously, in Islamic lands, there is tremendous pressure on Christians to deny their faith. But in lands that are free, uh, and that may even have a large number of Christians, there are subtle ways, you know, in your place of work. You've got to overlook immoral or improper or unethical business decisions in the government, whatever it may be. Uh, we show our faithfulness to Christ not only by what we say, but, but by what we do. The third thing Jesus repeatedly commends has to do with white garments. Uh, he tells the faithful believers in Sardis, you have not soiled your garments. Uh, they have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He tells Laodicea to obtain white garments so that you may clothe yourself uh, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Now, as I've mentioned in an earlier lecture, we know what these garments are. It's revealed in uh, Revelation 19, verse 8, that these pure garments are the righteous acts of the saints. So what this is telling us, I mean, Jesus was saying uh, this to the church in the first century. Uh, we now, in, in Revelation 19, verse 8, when the uh, pure garments are specifically defined, that's at the time, basically, of the second coming. So what all of this is saying is, what we do now has everlasting consequences. Every positive, righteous act we do in Jesus' name, because we love him, is like adding another stitch to the eternal garments with which we are clothing ourselves. So, perseverance, not denying his name and the faith when faced with pressure to do so, and doing the things we should, loving our neighbor as ourselves, are the things that Jesus is commending. So we need to be asking ourselves, how are we doing along those lines? Well, that leads to what Jesus promises. And at the end of each of these seven letters, he makes promises to those who overcome, to the overcomers. What is overcoming? Now, uh, overcoming is modeled, as I, I think I mentioned, overcoming really is remaining faithful, doing the things we should be doing, naming the name of Jesus, not denying the faith, not being an idolater, etc., all the way to the end. Because our overcoming is based upon Christ's own overcoming of Satan and death. Um, and Jesus was faithful all the way to the end. Um, and this is indicated later on in Revelation where there's a paradoxical nature of overcoming. What do I mean? In Revelation 11, uh, verse 7, and Revelation 13, verse 7, the beast is said to overcome the saints by causing their physical suffering and death. At the same time, however, uh, Christ and the saints are said to overcome the dragon, the beast, and all of their agents in Revelation 12, verse 11, why? Because of the word of their testimony, they did not love their life, even when faced with death. In other words, on the physical level, the beast may overcome us. You know, Muslim terrorists may kill Christians. So in the physical realm, we may say that the evil, the forces of evil overcame. But no, no, no. In the eternal spiritual realm, which is the one that ultimately counts. If we remain faithful even to death, it says in Revelation 12, verse 11, they are the, we are the overcomers because we did not love our life even when faced with death. So perseverance in faith, despite persecution and despite death, is victory for the church and it will be rewarded. So, now we need to know, there are not two classes of overcomers, overcomer, or there are not two classes of Christians. Jesus only makes promises to overcomers. And in uh, 
chapter 2, verse 26, he specifically linked being an overcomer with, quote, he who keeps my deeds until the end. It is our faithfulness unto death that reveals, are we truly believers? Is he truly our Lord? And so we need to ask, is he my true functional Lord? Now, he makes a number of promises to those who are overcomers, to those who are faithful. He makes four basic types of promises. And the first promise concerns life. To Ephesus, he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. To Smyrna, he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And to Sardis, he says, I will not erase his name from the book of life. These are all different ways of saying that everyone who is in Christ has eternal life. And again, the book of Revelation says there are two ends to every human being, either eternal life in a new glorious resurrected body, in a glorious new earth, or being cast into what Revelation 20 calls the lake of fire, which is the second death. There are no other alternatives. But it's important for us to know something. Eternal life begins now. In John 3, verse 36, it says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. That's present tense. Um, and Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And as he told the church in Sardis, I will not erase your name from the book of life. So, in other words, we have eternal life. It begins now. It's not just living a long time. Eternal life, in essence, is a different kind or quality of life. It is the life of Jesus himself. His values, his priorities, thinking like he thought, his compassion, acting like he acted, treating people the way he treated people. That is what being conformed to the image of Christ is all about, as it says in Romans 8, verse 29. So again, you look at these promises, we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus my true functional Lord? Not just lip service, but he, is he the one who is really determining my life and am I conforming to him? Now the second set of promises he makes concerns a name. To Pergamum, he says, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. To Sardis, he says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And to Philadelphia, he says, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven uh, from my God and my new name. Now, he says, I will give to Pergamum, he said, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but him who receives it. What is that? I don't know. No one knows but Jesus. But this does tell me something very important. It tells me that he knows us inside and out. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what is really in us and all of the potential in us. It's sort of like uh, Gideon back in the Old Testament book of Judges. I mean, Gideon said, my family is the least in the tribe of Manasseh. I'm the youngest in my father's house. And yet the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Um, and it's kind of like Smyrna. He said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. There is something in us that if we are in Christ, he knows us and is going to reveal who we really are are in him. Um, and I should point out that this business about confessing our name, he said, I'll confess our name before the Father, it's like eternal life. And it's confessing begins now. Jesus said in Matthew 10, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before the Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before the Father who is in heaven. So again, how we act now, our faithfulness, is revealing who we really are inside. Now, the third set of promises he gives to overcomers concern authority. By this I mean he promises Thyatira. He says, I will give authority over the nations, as I also received authority from my father. And to Laodicea he says, 
He who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my thrones, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Um, so we are going to have authority over the entire universe with Jesus. We see a picture of that, uh, as we discussed in an early, earlier lecture, of the church uh, already being raised and seated uh, in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, verse 6. And we see the picture of the church sitting on the thrones in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. But we're going to have authority in, in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Jesus said, uh, you know, he was faithful in little, will be faithful in much, and make him in charge of ten cities, and so on and so forth. This means something very important. Many people today connect their outward physical or economic condition with their spiritual condition, and the, true may, the two may not be related at all. I mean, look at uh, Laodicea said, I am rich and powerful and successful, and Jesus said, no, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And Sardis said, you know, I'm just so poor. And Jesus said, no, you're not. You are rich. Jesus has a different perspective, and the book of Revelation is important because it is giving us his perspective on the church, and therefore we need to act in conformity with our true spiritual state and not be misled or waylaid if our outward circumstances do not match who we really are. And the final set of promises concern our relationship with Jesus. To Pergamum, he says, I will give a uh, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. To Thyatira, he says, I will give him the morning star. And to Philadelphia, he says, to the overcomers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, we need to know something. Jesus is the white stone. Uh, in Mark 12, 10, he says, Have you not read the scripture, the stone which the builder rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the manna. In John 6, 6, Jesus said, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Jesus is the morning star. Revelation 22, verse 16. Jesus concludes the book by saying, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And the idea of oneness with Jesus is reinforced when he says, I will make the overcomer a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, in Revelation 21, in the New Jerusalem, it says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And so now Jesus is saying, in me, I'm going to make you a, a pillar in my temple. The pillar is an integral part of a building. What he is saying, we are going to be one in a way that you cannot imagine. Or to put it this way, Jesus is saying, everything that I am and everything that I have, I will give to you if you remain faithful to me. I am the manna. I am life. I give it to you. Uh, I am the white stone. I give it to you. I am the morning star. I am the temple. Um, and so Jesus is the bridegroom. We are his bride, but he is calling us to himself. We are called to have an intimate, personal, loving relationship with Jesus, closer than the greatest marriage between a husband and wife on this earth. That is what is important to him. Um, and so what do we think about this? You know, Jesus is not calling us to have him as an optional extra in our lives. These promises... These evaluations of the church, both negative and positive, and these promises reveal what is most important to Jesus. And we need to meditate on these things because is this intimate, personal relationship truly the most important thing to us? Or are we thinking, yeah, that sounds nice, but I hope I can live in a mansion on the new earth uh, and that I won't be bored. You see, all of these promises ultimately relate to our intimate, eternal oneness with him. And so, since this is what is most important to him, these are the most important things in the universe. This is what we have to look forward to. We need to meditate on these things because his promise ultimately 
is to give himself unreservedly and totally to us. And so that is why he is calling us now to give ourselves unreservedly and totally to him. These are amazing things that most of us don't think about. Let's think about them and live our lives accordingly.